The theme of Super Bowl 55 was the phenomenal game planning and execution by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense. And at this point, the topic has been exhausted in every way imaginable. There's not much to say about Tampa's defensive performance that hasn't already been said, so instead of covering the Bucks' defense as a whole, I chose to narrow my focus down to how they put constant pressure on Patrick Mahomes. As I'm sure you know by now, the Chiefs had a completely depleted offensive line going into the Super Bowl, and the Bucks took advantage, racking up an all-time Super Bowl high of 31 pressures while only blitzing on 5 plays. That means they sent only 3 or 4 rushers on 51 of Patrick Mahomes' 56 dropbacks, and still pressured him over 55% of the time. There is no precedent for this level of pass rush productivity without a blitz-heavy game plan. So today, I'm going to talk about how Todd Bowles and the Bucks defense absolutely abused the Chiefs offensive line and pressured Patrick Mahomes relentlessly. The main way the Bucks put pressure on the quarterback was by using stunts or games, which are a technique used by defensive linemen to get one rusher free without the need to use a pass rush move. Two different defensive linemen are typically responsible for executing a stunt. The penetrator's job is to attack one gap on the offensive line to draw a double team, while the looper runs around the double team for a free lane to the quarterback. As for terminology, stunts are described by naming the penetrator, then the looper. So if the defensive tackle is the penetrator and the edge is the looper, it will be called a TE stunt. Take this play from early in the first quarter as an example. The Bucks dictated Kansas City's protection call by aligning their linebackers in the B-gaps. Because there were five men on the line of scrimmage, Kansas City was forced to call 5-0 protection, which tells each offensive lineman to block the defender lined up directly opposite them. Stunts are most effective when used against man-to-man -man protection, which made this a perfect opportunity. Tampa Bay called mirrored ET stunts, where both of the edge rushers attacked the B-gaps and the speedy linebackers looped around to get pressure on the quarterback from the outside. The pressure caused Mahomes to miss what should have been a huge gain and possibly even a touchdown to Meikle Hardman on a deep corner route. Now, one would think that the Bucks might call this double ET stunt from a five-man front again considering how effective it was, but they didn't. In fact, the Bucks never called the same stunt more than twice all night, which kept the offensive line guessing as to what was coming on any given play. Take a look at this play from the third quarter, where the Bucks came out in the same five-man defensive front, but called a completely different stunt combination. This time, they're sending two penetrators and two loopers just to make things that much more complicated for an offensive line that already has a complete lack of communication and chemistry. When the center, Austin Reeder, sees the nose tackle Nadama and Sue penetrate and Devin White loop, he expects to get a simple TT stunt between Sue and White, so he prepares himself by dropping back and keeping his eyes on White. What he doesn't know is that Levante David is also a penetrator, so as Reader tracks White looping around to the opposite side, he gets completely blindsided by Levante David, who then gets into the pocket and causes Mahomes to throw an interception. The Tampa Bay defense did a great job of dictating Kansas City's protection calls with defensive alignment. And these five-man fronts are a good example because they forced KC into 5-0 protection. However, these five-man fronts with the linebackers lined up in the B-gaps are only useful on passing downs because they make the defense much more susceptible to a long rushing play than they would be if the linebackers were aligned off the ball. So, the Bucks manipulated KC's protection calls with four-man fronts as well, but before I get into how they did this, I want to explain how the pass protection calls that Tampa Bay was attacking work. As I mentioned earlier, man-to-man -man or solid protection is very susceptible to stunts and delayed blitzes because the offensive linemen will lock onto their man. And zone or full slide protection is tough to run effectively as well because when the entire line slides, the running back is forced to block a much bigger, much stronger edge rusher. So in the modern NFL, offenses have adapted by combining man and zone protection schemes to create half slide protection where one side of the offensive line is the zone or slide side, while the other side is the man or solid side. This prevents the running back from being forced to block a defensive lineman, and gives the offensive line the ability to slide one way. Predicting the direction of the protection slide is an extremely effective way to get pressure on the quarterback because of how effective stunts and delayed rushes are when run to the man side of the protection. And this can be done with defensive alignment. 
Look at the way Todd Bowles lined up his pass rushers on this play from the third quarter. The two defensive tackles and Shaq Barrett are all lined up to the offense's right, which forces the pass protection to slide to the right. When the guard on the man side of the protection does not have a defensive lineman covering him, he becomes part of the slide as well. So this is a four-man protection slide from Kansas City. That leaves the opposite side edge, Jason Pierre-Paul, isolated one-on-one -on -one against the left tackle, Mike Remmers. And I want you to watch how JPP slants his rush inside. He isn't trying to win his matchup here. He's trying to make Mahomes think that he has a free lane out of the pocket to his left. Mahomes takes the bait but quickly turns back around because Shaq Barrett looped all the way around to the man side of the protection and got into the pocket unblocked. This forced Mahomes to start running backwards and the play resulted in an incompletion on third down. Here's another example from later in the fourth quarter where three defensive linemen again lined up to the right of the center, with only one aligned to the left. Just like on the last play, this forced a four-man protection slide to the offensive right, leaving left tackle Mike Remmers isolated against Jason Pierre-Paul. JPP again slants his rush to the inside, which makes Mahomes think that he has a lane to step into, but he turns back around when the looping defensive tackle on the ET stunt, Steve McClendon, is there to keep him from the lane outside the tackle. Mahomes still made a ridiculous throw that almost kept the Chiefs in the game, but after that pass fell incomplete, the game was over. The question I asked myself after studying this game is, what does this mean for the Chiefs offense moving forward? I think that this was one of the best defensive performances we've ever seen in a Super Bowl, but that doesn't mean it will be easy to replicate. Tampa Bay's defensive game plan was so effective because it exploited the depleted Chiefs offensive line. They were missing four of their five starters, so when the continuity and chemistry is restored on that O-line, I don't think they'll continue to have so much trouble with stunts. I picked the Chiefs to win in this game because I just didn't believe that Todd Bowles would adjust his game plan enough to contain Mahomes. Bulls blitz 39% of the time during the regular season, according to Pro Football Reference, which was the fifth highest rate in the league, and he learned not to blitz Mahomes the hard way back in Week 12. Bulls completely changed his defensive philosophy, which proved everyone, including myself, wrong. He was coaching way out of his comfort zone, which makes the variation in his pass rush calls that much more impressive. Even when something worked exactly the way it was supposed to, he never called it the same way again because he didn't want to give the Chiefs offensive line any chance at adjusting. That is some Super Bowl level coaching, and Bulls deserves all the praise that's coming his way, as do the Buccaneers front seven, for being coachable and doing such a great job executing a game plan that was so different from what they'd done all season. But that's going to do it for today's video, so I hope you guys enjoyed. I haven't uploaded in a few weeks because I've been pretty busy, but I've got some exciting off-season stuff coming for you guys over the next month or so. I have two fully written scripts ready for recording, one is on Matt Stafford's fit with the Rams, and the other is on Two Attack of Iloa, where I give my opinion on what Miami should do with that number three overall pick. And after those two videos are recorded and edited, I'm going to do some scouting reports on this year's prospects, starting with Alabama receivers Jalen Waddell and Devontae Smith. So, like I said, good stuff coming this offseason, but that's all I've got for today. You can follow me on Twitter at the link in the description, and I'll see you in the next one.